Here we have another work by Donatello, and this is the Feast of Herod. This too has drama in it in a major way, plus the background, what I've drawn in here, is lines of perspective that I was trying to determine where is the vanishing point, and in fact these lines point to here. Now it's important to understand that's not here on this wall. It is a point far in the distance that all these things are receding to. So it would be behind all of this stuff. What's going on in the foreground, however, in this low relief? Well, there's the story. First of all, you have to understand, this is Herod, the Herod in the time of Jesus. Herod had stolen his brother's wife, Herodias. And that was a rather scandalous thing to do. John the Baptist was active at this time, and in addition to baptizing Jesus and more or less paving the way for Jesus as the Savior, John the Baptist criticized Herod for having taken his brother's wife. Herod paid some attention to John the Baptist, but also listened to him. He felt he was in some ways a holy man, a prophet, and he didn't really want to harm him. But his wife really didn't like the idea that John was saying these things. Now, his wife had a daughter by a previous marriage, Salome. And here's this banquet thrown by Herod. Herod wants to see Salome dance. And he promises her even up to half of his kingdom to watch her dance. So he said, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. Well, he didn't realize it, but, but Herodias had already talked to Salome and said the thing she should ask for in such an instance is the head of John the Baptist. Chop his head off and bring it to me on a platter. So that's, after dancing, that's what Salome asked for. Well, Herod couldn't go back on his word, so he actually had to give the order, and promptly somebody went and chopped John the Baptist's head off, and that's what's being delivered on this platter. Now, it's a very gruesome, disgusting scene. These people are recoiling. Herod is recoiling. Herodias is trying to calm him down and say, well, you know, maybe this isn't so bad. And people here are recoiling also. Lots of drama. That's exactly what Donatello was trying to do here. This is not one of those staid scenes pictured in the Middle Ages where everybody's sort of looking around and sort of laying around a bunch of different figures. All these figures are here for a reason. And they all tell a dramatic story in the way that this is composed. So this is a big departure from the type of statuary and the type of decoration, this gilt bronze that existed just in the Gothic era earlier. Here we see some of the same with the statues of Daniel and Isaiah. This is Daniel. This is Isaiah. Both of them are authors of books in the Bible that are taken to be predictions of the coming of Christ many years later. So they're shown here with these kinds of scrolls, which they may have uh, written things on, and, and they have distinct characters of their own. They don't look like the same face. They don't look like the same person. Now, we really don't know what they look like, but they're given very distinctive different appearances. And as Gombrich points out, they really don't look like statues that we had seen in the Middle Ages. They look like they might just be actors in a play, getting ready to speak their lines. Realism here is taking hold. It's it's coming back. It's creeping in. And eventually, what will be attained in the Renaissance is artistry on the same scale and the same quality and caliber that existed in the Greek era. In this era, to praise somebody, they would say, you've done it as well as the ancients, the ancient Greeks. Now we come to another artist who is famous, very famous for this development. Thinking about a different binder other than egg yolk, egg tempera, Jan van Eyck hit upon using oil, and one kind or another of oil, not the kind of oil we think about that's mined in the ground, but oil from various kinds of plants or pressed from uh, olives or various other sources, linseed oil, oil that would be mixed with the pigment to create a paint that would be slow drying, and that's the key. In being slow drying, the artist has much more time to work with it. Plus another important factor that oil, if you've ever seen oil on paper, for example, it makes the paper translucent. In fact, in the earlier days, when people couldn't afford glass, and glass was an expensive commodity, they would just have oiled paper for a window. Well, more or less to keep the weather out, but to let some light in. So the translucency of oil is very important because you can layer one oil paint on another. And by doing that, you can actually create different kinds of colors in the way that the oil of one overlaying pigment lets some of the color from underneath through. Now this is an altarpiece. This actually here is 
a crack where this this side can open up and this side can open up. And we're going to see it opened up in just a second. And here it is. Now opened up on holy days, it would be in the front of the church and it would be very grand and glorious with all these colors. And on days that were not holy days, it would look like this. It would be more staid and more subdued. So let's take a look at this first. This is once again a picture of God looking like the Pope with a crown. Here's the Virgin Mary, here's John the Baptist. Ooh, who's standing here? And who's standing here? A little bit ashamed of being naked. Well, that's Adam and Eve. Scandalous thing to have painted them this way, because throughout the ancient times, the Greeks had idealized the shape and the depiction of the human body. However, here we have somebody who isn't necessarily... A, the finest physical specimen around, and the woman here doesn't quite have the shape of some of the Greek statues you might have seen. She's much more real. It really is thought that Van Eyck had used real people for this. So that was in a way scandalous, but here's what's being done with oil. Take a look here at the way that this cloth is represented. The light perspective, light here, dark here, makes it look very much 3D. Very fine work here that you could do with oil because you could work with it longer. The same goes with the clothing on God himself. And the same goes for the way skin tones can be represented in the clothing here. And the detail here with this cloth, very much detail. And all of these faces too, the way that they're shown in light and shadow. So we're seeing here chiaroscuro, that's light perspective. We're seeing here another kind of perspective. Take a look here in the distance. Do you see that it's turning blue back here? That is, I don't want to obliterate it, but I will circle it for you. Turning blue in the distance. Atmospheric perspective is being used here to give this scene some depth. And you might also notice that it's slightly fuzzier here. That's focus perspective. A great amount of detail could be gained with oil painting here in the foreground where you would naturally expect to see more detail. But it was important to fuzzy it up a bit and not make it so precise back here. That's one of the things that makes art look phony and flat. If it's very detailed in the background, you don't get that perception of depth because it's not the way your eye sees it in real life. Now the scene here, what's being represented is from the book of John, uh, Jesus, the symbolic lamb, the sacrificial lamb, and the rest of these figures on this inside being depicted as human beings, as people. But when this artwork is closed, we see now the Virgin represented as a statue, and John represented as a statue, and we see here this traditional scene of the Annunciation, and they look like statues as well. Perhaps it was considered to be more formal. The statuary here that's being depicted for these, you can compare that with the way Giotto did a fresco of a statue in an earlier chapter on page 200 in the Gombrich book. Compare that with this illustration, and you'll see there's a lot of similarity there. What Van Eyck was doing here was copying that same way of depicting a person as a statue, but in a painting but it still looks like the statue would look in real life because of the way he's used the light perspective to capture light and shadow as it would really exist on a 3D image. The thing to remember here is detail like this is possible. And let me just explain a little bit how this was often done. Black would be used to paint these shaded areas. And then because oil paint is translucent, green would be put over it and the green would show through the shading of the black underneath. So it wasn't as if the artist actually had to mix all these different shades of green. You could actually accomplish it by painting the shading in sort of like black and white, then going over it with the green, and the green, because it's translucent, unlike egg tempera, would show the shading underneath. Things like that became possible with oil painting, and once Van Eyck demonstrated what could be done. The entire art community went over to using oil-based paints as opposed to egg tempera. There are still some people who work in it, but it's the alternative is very appealing.